Greetings from Mesa View United Methodist Church of Albuquerque, New Mexico. We hope this message will be meaningful and relevant to your life and your relationship with God. We invite you to join us for worship on Sunday mornings. Our traditional service is at 8.30 a.m. and at 11 a.m. we gather for contemporary worship. More information may be found at our website, mesaviewumc.com. Now may you be blessed through the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Our Hebrew scripture reading today is Micah 6, 1 through 8, and it may be found on page 816 in the Old Testament. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of the kings Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, please plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? <coughs> Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent you Moses, Aaron and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now how King Balak of Moab devised, and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shetham to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord, and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? <coughs> he has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. This week I did a Google search on to find out what the most famous passages in the Bible are. The results I found were not necessarily the most famous, but instead the most looked up passages of Scripture. At the top of the list are ones you would sort of expect to be there. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. The 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Paul's famous passage about love from 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient and kind, love is not boastful or envious. Those you would sort of expect to be there, what I expected to be there. And then there were some I was totally surprised by. Like there's a passage from Zephaniah, we'll discuss Zephaniah in three weeks. It says, the Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. That was one of the most popular passages. I'm guessing it's probably taken totally out of context, but it's not a passage I normally quote. It would not have been one I would have expected in the top 10 or top 25. But the reason I was looking up was to see whether any passages from Micah were included in that list, because there's two very famous passages from Micah, and another passage is famous that we don't actually know is famous from Micah. The one we probably don't know is from Micah is the prophecy that we get that the Messiah will come from the town of Bethlehem. In the fifth chapter we hear, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from the old, from ancient days. So as we move into Advent and Christmas and we're talking about Jesus coming from Bethlehem, it's Micah who gives us that prophetic claim that we are answering there. A more famous passage is from the fourth chapter of uh, Micah, where he says, they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they uh, learn war anymore. 
Most of us are more familiar with that passage from Isaiah. Isaiah is a contemporary of Micah, and these passages appear word for word in both Isaiah and in Micah. But by far the most common passage, one of my favorite pieces of scripture, is Micah 6, 8, which we heard this morning. God has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Now we are told that Micah is from the small town of Moresheth, which is about 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem. He prophesies under the reigns of kings uh, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, which puts his dating about 730 to 700 BCE. As I said, Isaiah is a contemporary of Micah's, as is Hosea. This is a time of great conflict and turmoil, both for the northern kingdom Israel and also for the southern kingdom of Judah. During his prophetic reign, the northern kingdom is destroyed by the Assyrian Empire in the year 721, and the Assyrians also attack Judah and lay siege to Jerusalem, but they are spared destruction because King Hezekiah agrees to pay a very large ransom, a tribute to the Assyrian Empire for them to go away, and so Jerusalem is spared at that moment. Many of Micah's prophecies are against the northern kingdom of Israel, referred to as Samaria in his writings. But they also apply to Judah itself. And later when the Babylonians are invading and the prophet Jeremiah is writing, he will actually quote from the prophet Micah about the coming destruction of Jerusalem. But Micah is in many ways like the prophet Amos that we looked about several weeks ago about their proclamation about why Israel and then later Judah will be destroyed. It is because of their treatments of the poor and social outcasts that the rich are getting richer at the expense of the poor while the poor are getting poorer, that justice is not being conducted within the realm, that judgments are made based upon who is given the largest amounts of money, that the ruling elites make rules that benefit only them while ignoring the cries of those at the bottom of society, and my favorite part, that prophets will offer goodwill and blessings to those who give them money, and preachers will only teach the Torah for people who pay them. So the passage we heard from the sixth chapter of Micah begins as a court case. A court case with God as the plaintiff and Israel standing as the accused. The first voice we hear is that of Micah the prophet's calling the witnesses, the judges, into courts, in this case calling forth the mountains and the hills, who will stand in witness of what God has to say against Israel. We could say it's sort of the whole creation that, that Micah is calling out to listen to God's complaints. And then God begins his accusation, which is basically that the people have forgotten what God has done for them. And because the people have forgotten, we might sort of expect a righteous indignation, anger from God towards Israel, certainly what we see in other parts of Micah, and certainly what we see in the other prophets. But instead here we have a sense of sort of bewilderment on God's behalf, asking them, what is it that I have done? What, how have I wearied you in these things? But we also have to notice there's a sense of intimacy expressed, and God begins this complaint saying, Oh, my people, claiming who they are at the beginning of this trial. And then God lists some of the things that he has done on the people's behalf. That he's led them out of slavery from the land of Egypt. That he's given them leaders to guide them and lead them, people like Moses. And then the list goes on and on. God has done all these things for the people, first so that they will know the power of God, but more importantly, God's done this because God has a covenantal relationship with Israel. He's upholding God's side of the, the covenants. So the, he's saying, you cannot complain that I'm uncaring, that I, I'm not noticing what's going on. These are all the things I've done for you. And so if there's a break in covenantal relationship, it rests with the people who are the next voice we hear as they're responding to God, asking what it is that they can do to make things right. So they first ask if it's just sort of a normal offering, 
And then it sort of goes excessive. Shall we bring thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil in order to, to make things right? This is when you really mess up and you say, a dozen roses isn't going to do it this time. I've got to show up with jewelry to make things right. <laughs> But God is saying that the, the problem is not the problem is not me. The problem is you. And so doing these outward displays, trying to placate me, isn't going to make any difference. It's not going to solve the problem. Now, if you remember back when we looked at Amos, Amos makes exactly the same sort of claims against the, the people. And God says in return, I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being and of fatted calves, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like the waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. That is, the outward displays of religiosity are not enough. Unless they are accompanied by the inward change and an inward decision to follow God. To do what God has called us to do. But as chapter 6, or the passage we heard from chapter 6 ends, we don't get a judgment, which we would expect in a court case. God doesn't even give a final argument after the people respond to God. Instead, Micah says, stop asking what God wants you to do. You know what God wants you to do. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Now, there are lots of ways to encapsulate our faith in a, a few words. But I think this passage, Micah 6, 8, is one of those ways we can cancel out our face. But I think that we make mistakes often when we read this, or certainly how we, we talk about it, because what we often hear or think, or certainly what we practice, is that the passage says, love justice and do kindness or do mercy, is how some translations have it, and walk humbly with our God. That's the way we like to think of it, and we do lots of acts of mercy. We like to, to feed people and clothe people and visit people who are sick and in prison, all those things that Jesus said to do, to, as you do them to me, so you do them to the least of these. And that's important work. But what Micah says is that we are to love these things, but we are to do justice. Not love justice, do justice, and love kindness and mercy. And that's where the really hard work begins. As Archbishop of Brazil, uh, Dom Helder Carrera, once said, when I fed the poor, they called me a saint. That is, when he does works of mercy, they love him. But when I ask why the poor are hungry, they call me a communist. That is, when he acts about works of justice, people don't like it. Now, we often also misunderstand the words that are being used here. Not intentionally, but simply because the English doesn't really convey what the Hebrew is saying to us. So, for example, we hear mercy, and it's often related to helping people who are in need. The Hebrew word is hesed. It's often translated as love or mercy, loyalty, kindness, steadfast love, loving kindness. But there's not really a good word in English that encapsulates what it means in Hebrew. That's why sometimes... In sermons, or you'll be reading something, it'll just have the word hesed like we all understand what it means. But we, there's not a word in English that sort of captures the essence of what hesed means. <coughs> what it means in Scripture is in relationship with another person who is in need of significant help. Often help that is for their basic well-being and sometimes even their survival depends on showing or practicing hesed. So if we think of the story of the Good Samaritan, if you remember that story, a man is beaten and left on the side of the road, and lots of other people walk by, and the Samaritan stops, and he renders aid, and he bandages his wounds. But not only does he stop and help, but he then takes him to an inn, and he, help, he helps 
you know, bring him back to, to health, and then he has to leave, and he says to the innkeeper, whatever it costs to bring him back to full health, I'll pay that cost. I'll be back to pay your bill. That's Hesed, going far beyond the expectation of giving help. That he could have just stopped and bandaged his wounds, maybe called for somebody to come help him, or taken him to the inn and saying he needs help, and going on. The Good Samaritan goes far beyond what a normal expectation would be to practice this mercy, this Hesed. And it's also then a movement towards justice for this individual. And when we think of justice, we often think of legal system and laws, and that's certainly a part of what entails justice in Scripture, but it's only a small part, because first we have to remember that just because something is legal does not mean it's just. There are lots of things that have been legal to do, apartheid, Jim Crow laws, voter suppression, lots of things are, have been legal, but they're clearly not just. Because what is legal is about power, not about justice. So it's more than just law. The Hebrew word for justice is mispax. And it refers to God's order taking place in everything and in every area of society. To do justice is to order everything with God's will. And that's what justice involves, is not just legal justice, but it's economic justice, and it's social justice, and it's environmental justice. What we see in the, the minor prophets that I never picked up before is how many of them have sort of an environmental message that God is also speaking to the creation. In Micah, creation is acting as judge with God of what Israel is doing. But most importantly, we have to know that justice is not about us, it, I mean, it has impact on us. But most importantly, it's about justice for others. <coughs> and in Scripture in particular, justice is about what happens to the least of those in society. Often those who have no say in what's happening. So in the immigration raids this past week in Las Cruces, it was reported by some members of our churches down there who were stopped by ICE agents and some clergy members who went to observe what was happening, that the agents were just going into trailer parks and just knocking on doors demanding to see identification. That is, they had no justification of believing that these people were undocumented, but because they were brown and lived in poverty, it was assumed that that's what was happening. They were guilty until proven otherwise. That's an unjust situation. Regardless of what you think about immigration, I think we can say if they're being stopped simply because they're brown and poor, that's injustice taking place. And one of the ways we can look at that is, can we apply that rule to, as a universal to society? How would you feel if the police started pounding on your door for saying, give me documentation to prove that you are allowed to be in this country? What would happen if white people in the suburbs of middle class started having ICE agents pounding on doors? We would rise up and complain. So if we're, we would do that for ourselves, then we can say the same thing has to be happening when it's happening to other brothers and sisters. Now we could talk lots of ways about injustice, but I wanted to, and I thought of lots of different stories and found some but another way that we can see injustice taking place is a, a personal story. In the late 90s, I was working for a small nonprofit, and we were advocating and doing demonstration models of building low-income housing using environmentally sustainable building <coughs> materials, and also including alternative energy sources. And so one year, there was a bill before the state legislature that would set up to allow people who were using solar and wind mainly to connect their, their systems back to the grid to sell their power back to the power companies. Now at the time, the power companies were opposed to this. And so there was a few of us who were advocating to the legislator in, in support of this, and so when we finally got a hearing before the Senate on this bill, I went and spoke uh, in, in support of this bill. And at the end of the session, there was lots of people who spoke there in opposition, the senator who had sponsored the bill said he called this, he wanted to know how many lobbyists 
the power companies had in the state of New Mexico. And so he called the Secretary of State office. And to give you some background, if you're lobbying the, the, the state legislature and you spend half of your time doing that activity, then you have to register as a lobbyist. If you spend less than half of your time lobbying, you can do that and not be registered. And so CEOs and COOs and CFOs of power companies don't spend half their time, so they're not on the, the lobbyist list. So he called the Secretary of State and said, how many registered lobbyists does the power companies in Mexico have? They had more registered lobbyists than there were senators and representatives in the legislature in New Mexico. That means they could have one person in every single office saying, be in opposition to this bill, when there was nobody on our side who was a registered lobbyist, because none of us were spending half our time lobbying. And we won't go into campaign financing that goes along with that. And so this senator says, you know, I know this bill was going to be defeated when I started it, but, you know, someday it's going to be passed when the power companies realize it's in their best interest to do that. And now, what do you have? Solar companies knocking on your door to get you connect to the, the grid. Why? Because it's now legal, because the power companies want that power coming into the system. So these two are justice issues, because they're about power. And so it's not about complaining about these things. Micah says, do justice. And that's hard. That's really, really hard. Because how do we as one person or even as a small group figure out, and how do we come to agree on what it is that we should be even talking about? But Micah says, love kindness, but do justice. And it also then goes into alignment with the last thing that Micah says that we are to do, and that is to walk humbly with our God. And again, it's important to know that the word translated here as humble is not what that means in Hebrew. Because the, the Hebrew word for humble, which is not the word used here, refers not to somebody who's sort of self-effacing, who doesn't boast or brag about themselves. The word Hebrew word for humble usually denotes someone whose socioeconomic or political situation is insignificance, often involves suffering or depredation. Instead, the Hebrew word here is hasene, and I'm guessing on the pronunciation because I couldn't find anything to tell me how to pronounce this one Hebrew word. And the, the better translation is not humble, but attentive, paying attention, or watching. So we have humble being, again, that sort of self-effacing. That goes into what's being said here, but the best analogy I could come up with is when you're walking a dog. If a dog has been properly trained and knows how to heal, that is not at the end of the leash pulling you along, but actually at your heel and walking along beside you, that's what's being talked about here. Because the dog has to subordinate its will to the person that's walking them. And they have to be paying attention to what that person is doing so they know when to stop and they know when to turn and they know when to go. So it's not just subordinating their will, they also have to be attentive to what's happening. They can't be pulling at the leash, they can't be smelling all the bushes and the roses all along the way. They can't be doing their own will. They have to be attentive to the will of the person who's walking them. That's what Mike is talking about. So is there one of us a dog in this scenario? Yes, one of us is a dog in this scenario. <laughs> Micah is saying, walk attentively with God. That is, pay attention to what God's doing. Subordinate your will to God's will, your desires to God's desires. Live in alignment with God's will, not just for your life, but for the world. Now, in the earliest days of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, was asked, what is it that we should be doing as Methodists? What are the rules we should live by? And he came up with three rules, which are now known as the three simple rules. The first was to do no harm. The second was to do good. And the third was to attend upon all the ordinances of God, which means nothing to us now. It's sort of, you know, like, you stare at me. And so it's been simplified to stay in love with God. 
which is how we deepen our relationship with God. Scripture reading, attending worship, uh, fasting, participating in communion, um, prayer, all those things that we do to deepen our faith life fall in that stay in love with God piece. And all these things build on each other. If you're not doing harm, it will lead you to do good. And if you're doing no harm and doing good, it will lead you to staying in love with God. And if you're staying in love with God, it's going to lead you back to doing no harm and doing good. The same thing happens with these rules from Micah. If you are walking attentively with God, subordinating your will to God's will, then you'll be seeking to do justice in society. And you'll be seeking to love kindness. And if you're loving kindness and doing justice, it will help you walk that path with God. Now, every week when we say the Lord's Prayer, we pray for God's kingdom to come and God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. That God calls for us to have justice on earth just as it is in heaven. To do justice in what we see continually in Scripture is that justice is measured by what we do to the most vulnerable in our communities. And God calls for us to love mercy, to do love kindness, to hesed, going above and beyond what's expected in a situation to provide assistance to somebody. And God calls us to walk attentively with God, subordinating our will to God's will. To paying attention always to what God is calling us to do and where God is leading us. Not just for our lives, but for the world. So what does the Lord require of you? Do justice and love kindness and walk attentively with your God. I pray that it will be so, my brothers and sisters. Amen.